Thank you so much for the introduction, Jeremy, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think it's also my first time post-pandemic, or after some parts of the pandemic, I don't know, to actually speak in front of a larger audience that's not my classroom, so that's very exciting. So, I'm not trying to convince you that the future of mixed reality is adaptive. This is one possible future where the future of mixed reality is adaptive. We'll find out. Um, I want to start with some definitions for people who are not that familiar within that space. So, when, we, when I talk about mixed reality, what I mean is essentially a spectrum, where on the left side we have the real world as we are right now, and on the right side you have a fully immersive environment. So here is um, a remote search, uh, surgical simulator or trainer, where everything that's happening is actually remotely, uh, is, is immersive. And somewhere in between, there is a space where we have the real world that is actually overlaid with virtual information. So here uh, is uh, a HoloLens demo, HoloLens 2, Julie Schwartz showing off some of her, um, of the uh, interaction techniques that work in mixed reality. This is where we are now, but I think in order to understand where we're going, I would like to take like three minutes to see kind of where are we actually coming from. And I always find this some of a kind of uh, an interesting exercise to, to also give people a sense of how long have we actually been working or have people been working on the space of mixed reality. So, one of the earliest examples, really, of where you can see virtual reality or some kind of immersive experience is uh, Morton Halleck's Sensorama. They're kind of immersive video uh, with kind of multi-sensory, multi-modal. Um, you had to walk through um, kind of the, there's this film piece where they actually do, I think, a motorcycle ride through Brooklyn. Um, so this is 60 years ago already, where we say, hey, the first in one of the first instances of what is considered immersive media has been around. Within that space, also one of the first instances of augmented reality, so uh, you see the real world and it's overlaid with, phys with virtual information has been presented. So here's Aylan Sutherland's display system, which she detailed in the Ultimate Display article. Um, so it's actually connected to the, what's called the Sword of Damocles, which is a ceiling bolted mechanical tracking system. And you could actually see 3D content that is somewhat aligned to how you rotate. So this type of augment, augmented reality has been around also for equally long. Fast forward 20 years, um, computing, kind of desktop computing, there's a lot of has happened, where suddenly in the 90s, there hasn't happened kind of a lot within that space in between, where we have VPL research with where the, uh, the person on the right, John Lanier, coined the term virtual reality. And there had already a lot of interesting hardware that's not dissimilar from what we have now. So you have on the left side the data glove and the iPhone, as they were called, like for I, not with an I, um, the data suit. Um, so it looked very glorious, I think, kind of essentially the, the, the big headset. But it really didn't take off because the visual quality was not there where people wanted it to be for a lot of the use cases that we have now. At the similar time, gaming and simulation was one of the main usages for it. And don't be mistaken that any of this is handheld, whatever. And the second to the right, the image on the treadmill, the treadmill is the computer. So there, it's not like here, it's everything is integrated, whatever. The, all of these things were ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, not inflation adjusted. Um, so the visual quality wasn't there, but a lot of the spirit and a lot of the ideas that are now around has been around for, for a long, long time. Again, nothing happens for 20 years. <laughs> um, we're at 2007, roughly, where the introduction of the smartphone really brought down display prices, brought down sensor prices, and stuff became very viable for actually the new, the uh, second or third phase of mixed reality product and mixed reality research. That some accumulated in um, the development of the Quest, which was the first headset that was low cost, that had great sensing already in, inside. Um, none of this happened in a vacuum. There was a lot of development at Xerox Park, at Microsoft Research, and a lot of other folks were involved. But this is where it became uh, commercially viable. So this is virtual reality. And at the same time, we have, in the same year, pretty much Google Glass coming out, um, which essentially, if you've never tried it, it's a relatively big screen that's floating in front of you. So it's not registered augmented reality where you have kind of a hologram living somewhere, but it's really just a big screen. Um, and also an idea that actually Steve Mann 
15, 20 years earlier has already tried out. So none of these things happen in a vacuum. However, if you look at the state of the art now, on the right side, kind of the prosumer, kind of $10,000 headsets, and then like all the stuff that's around up to the lower left with the Meta Quest 2 with like for free $400, you see that suddenly we have hardware that is affordable for different kind of um, different usage scenarios, and that also has a decent quality to actually work out for us. And these days, the applications are not dissimilar than 20 or 30 years ago. However, we see a lot of adoption that has already happened. So you use it for productivity or for casual interaction. Pokemon Go um, was, a, was a big hit. Um, for healthcare, it's a humongous topic in healthcare. And also, we can't be naive, the military is a very big player in that field where the US military bought, I think, 150,000 what is essentially a modified HoloLens device um, and gave a big boom to that market. So the first thing that I would like to say within that space is I think that VR is going to be here. VR is going to stay, it's not going to go away like 20 years ago. We've seen tremendous successes of the technology. So fully immersive technology, it has been used uh, by, by the European uh, flight agency, has been approved for helicopter training. Um, Meta sold 15 million devices of, the, of these headsets, and as Jesse Shell from Shell Game puts it, we see networking effects pretty much I'm imagining that everybody in this room at least knows somebody who owns one of these devices. And one of the things that excites me honestly most is virtual reality has been successful in randomized controlled trials for pain relief. So as a complement to traditional pain medication, which if you look at the US with the opioid crisis, is a really, really big step where you could see that uh, it's available in hospitals or that it is essentially available for home therapy, for treatment of PTSD. And the hardware is now cheap enough that this is, is essentially viable. So the first thing that I want to say is VR, I think, has been successful to a certain degree um, and that it's going to be here to stay. But there is one question for me that is, what, is actually, what, what about mixed reality? And I want to show you kind of a, a, a snapshot of this kind of cheesy advertisement that came out a couple of weeks ago, where kind of imagine you're in a subway, but you are somewhat immersed in your virtual environment. Um, you have like your screens, you have all your contents there. So it holds somewhat the promise that it could potentially do things that... I'm going to stop that video here because it's really... Okay, it's not getting better. Um, but if we look at it on a more serious side, it has really the potential to complement and replace a lot of the devices that we currently use. Our smartphones, our desktop computing devices, our tablets. You could even imagine uh, an, an environment where all this screen doesn't actually exist, but you're wearing glasses, like in the movies. So it could free us from kind of this whole distraction that our devices are, where everybody essentially is sitting now in the audi audience resisting the urge to pull out the phone and kind of just quickly check your emails, but actually have something that's more beneficial, but actually more in the background. So I think that this is a an idea of a future that is worth pursuing and where we try to see, okay, what are actually the parts that we need to get right in order for this to work out? Um, and when I say work out, I mean that it comes to a future where it's beneficial in terms of interaction, where it frees us from our devices, but is less distracting than what we currently have. Only then, if it's going to be more distracting, I think it's not going to be successful, and we, I'm going to be standing here in 20 years again and say, like, maybe the next future is adaptive. But we, we'll see. So what are the parts that we need to get right? And I'm a technical human-computer interaction researcher, so I'm kind of tech-focused. But in the end of the talk, I'm also going to touch a couple of other topics that I think are important here. But let's, if you bear with me for, for a couple of minutes, here are the things that I think need to be, that where we need to actually make advances here. First, hardware that is around displays, haptics, auditory output devices. We made good progress, but still all of them are kind of still not fantastic. Computer vision researchers, machine learning researchers still need to get their sensing right. If you want to say, hey, I would like to have really great tracking, it needs to be very seamless. We need to have notion of, okay, where people are, where in the environment are we, what is in terms of scene understanding, which objects are where and where do they end and so on. So there's a lot of work to be done there. 
privacy and communications, networking is still very challenging. Um, if you imagine you wear a display on your face that can potentially display content at any point in time, someone hacks it and displays come an ad in front of your face just as you're crossing the street, suboptimal. So there's a lot of work here. What my area of expertise is, is the last part, where, we, where the technology intersects with the human and where we interact with the technology, and that's the interaction part. A lot of this starts with one observation, which is if we compare 2D user interfaces, for example, on the left side with my desktop computer, and 3D user interfaces in mixed reality, we can see that a lot of these from a content creator, from a designer, from a programmer point of view, are extremely challenging to create. So here, as I said, on the left is my computer, on the right is me kind of sitting in a part of my small research lab where I just kind of wear an augmented reality headset and um, there are just a couple of floating user interface elements as a replacement. So if we take 2D interfaces, they are awesome, right? From a programmer point of view, you're always constrained to your display. I, I always know exactly where, they go, where they are. They are not floating somewhere in space. They are typically always in reach for, for, um, for, for users. So if I take my smartphone, I can kind of, if I have it in my hand, I can interact with it. And also, it's really independent of the surrounding. If I design a mobile application, I don't care if the user uses it on the subway, on the go, on stage, wherever you use your smartphone. It's pretty much always the same. If we move into a third dimension where we had a headset that could display contents everywhere, suddenly we could design a user interface that takes up all, all the space in the world. So essentially, if you are wearing an AR headset, it could display something right between us, which would be suboptimal for the situation we're currently in. It could be anywhere in space, it could be here right in, in nice uh, in, in near side, but it could be like uh, five, ten meters away. And it's also strongly influenced by the surroundings. If you walk by, you have a lot of visual noise between the different, uh, different depth layers, essentially. So all of these things need to be accounted for. In addition, on the left side, right, user interface elements can be spatially distributed anywhere uh, in space, and maybe they're kind of they're somewhat blocking, and they need to be well embedded within the space they're in. And also, as I said, the interaction range. I don't want to need to walk up and walk to my music application in order to change it, if it uh, actually could kind of do something more clever. There are a variety of ways to mitigate that from, from an interaction point of view. So colleagues in the field of human-computer interaction or graphics have come up with a plethora of really, really cool interaction techniques that allow for kind of that you can move objects in 3D or you can translate and move them around or scale them. Um, there are uh, Per Stuart Dani from, from uh, Stanford, now Princeton University, has done a lot of really cool work in how do you navigate these spaces. And also um, colleagues like Max Speicher and, and Anna Feit have worked a lot on how do you actually do text input in AR, in VR. Well, those are all fantastic works, but one of the challenges is still, if it's spatially distributed, it's going to be annoying to get to. If it blocks my field of view, I'm going to be annoyed by it. So the, one of my main objectives for my research is, let's create something that's not necessarily annoying. So to put this in a kind of less informal way, essentially what I'm interested in, how do we present the right information with the right appearance at the right position and at the right time? So when, where, and how? is our, our, the main research question, in particular for contexts where the user is inherently dynamic, right? I need this thing to work on a subway, on the bus, on the plane, in my living room, in my office, like all the different contexts where just you think about how many different spaces you've encountered today. It needs to work everywhere. So I think there are three key components to that, and that is where a lot of research and also my research uh, works in. So one is understanding and predicting human perception and behavior. Then the second part is actually adaptive user interfaces, computational approaches for mixed reality, which is going to be a larger part of, I'm going to show you a lot of example there. And then if we figure those out, 
we can think about how could we actually enhance users' capabilities and performance when we were to deploy these technologies. So going beyond what is currently possible with our smartphones and actually do things that we couldn't do before. And I want to go through all three of these for the remainder of, of this lecture. So when I talk about understanding and predicting behavior, some examples of what I think we can think about is, hmm, can we actually predict where users are looking at or where users will be looking at if they see a specific scene? This could give us important information of what is kind of something people care about and then say, hey, if I know that this is salient, um, for example, here the face, one place to not put a user interface element is right in front of the face of someone else or right at a specific part of a scene um, that, that, is, that is not great. Or maybe if you think about your living room, maybe not in front of your nice painting that is on the wall or your favorite artifact. All of these are visually salient, so people's gaze is attracted to it. So those are great indicators for us to know, kind of leave those alone. Other aspects that we should consider when we design for such scenarios for what we've called in a workshop always on mixed reality scenarios where you constantly, where you could constantly uh, receive such information is, for example, navigation instructions. So if you think about you wear an AR headset, how would you want the system to guide you through your city? Um, this could be like on the top left, a direct, essentially, translation from Google Maps, like arrows on the ground. But what we found also is that people are more open to very different types of navigation instructions. For example, if you're strolling through, kind of, I've, it's my second time in Montreal, um, what people like if they're strolling is like an, a small avatar that just guides them through it and presents them with nice information or more information uh, that than arrows provide, like callouts, as we call them, that provide contextual information. And if you're really, really rushed, like on the airport yesterday, I landed at like 30 minutes to change planes, uh, to change gates, people are more open to drastic changes. Like on the right side, what we did is we presented users for that in virtual reality, actually. We made the whole environment grayscale, except for this narrow path where they actually wanted to walk. And we were interested, is this something people actually would want, or is this something that is really a dumb idea? And it turns out, within a specific context where they are rushed and you, you don't care about your surrounding, people actually appreciate the, very, the clarity of those, um, of those representations. So here we try to understand user's preference within a certain context. What else we are, what, we, what we're also interested in is here, for example, um, the concept of what is called diminished reality. So diminished reality refers to the concept of removing objects from your visual field if they are not needed. There's even a Black Mirror episode about that where they remove people um, that are not needed. Not great, very dystopian. Um, but we are still interested in is this concept something that people might appreciate for certain contexts? So here is an example which we tested in a scanned environment where we removed stuff that is not needed for a specific task. And it turns out people actually do appreciate that for a visual search task. Or if they really want to focus on kind of getting this 15 minutes of writing done or kind of getting through that email or doing whatever, that we actually remove objects from their visual field as long as they have still, still have awareness of where things are and what is going on. So in a context-dependent manner, if we understand what people actually want, we, can perf we actually have a very large repertoire of stuff that we can do to make their lives easier. And this is really the key observation that guides the second part of, the, um, of where we are, which are computational approaches for mixed reality. So this is somewhat, I would like to show you a couple of different examples where we can leverage the knowledge to really adapt mixed reality, where I think this is a key component for, the, uh, for mixed reality to, to actually become useful um, in, I don't know, in a couple of years' time when the hardware and the sensing get ready. So when I talk about con computational approaches, I typically mean a three-step approach to that. One is we take some kind of contextual information. Contextual information could be where is the user? Is the user stressed? Is the user bored? Are they hungry? Are they, I don't know. Are they with other people? Then we use this information and pipe it into an algorithm, into a computer system that can be machine learning based, that can be optimization based. In my heart, I'm a computer scientist, so that's the part that I find very fun. 
Um, however, it's underlyingly we need, because a lot of the contextual information continuously changes, we, it can't be up to the content creator and app designer to actually use it. It needs to have some algorithmic support. And lastly, we use that information to do something clever, um, to change the placement of a user interface element so it's, or the visibility so that it appears just right at the time when the user actually needs it, or to remove it when the user does not need it. Within the work that me and my research lab have been doing, we typically distinguish between two different areas of, um, of contextual information. The one is a user-centric approach where we try to gather in a privacy-preserving, more or less privacy-preserving, depending on the context manner, what do users currently need and then adapt the system accordingly. The other part are environment-centric approaches where we take anything we can learn about an environment, where are you, what objects are in there, where are these objects, kind of how are these connected to your virtual objects, um, and leverage those to make clever decisions. So as an input for our algorithmic decision making uh, or decision support, as I called it earlier. So I would like to present kind of four brief instances of that. So one is we adapt the user interface based on what we estimate their cognitive load is, or for multiple users. And on the space environment centric approaches, we adapt the user interface based on the semantic connection between virtual and physical objects, or based on the geometry of the physical objects that are within a space. So um, that allows us to tightly integrate information um, into, into an environment. So I want to briefly spend a, a couple of minutes to talk about, um, about those. So I want to start with top left, I'm just going to go through them, uh, the cognitive load. So here is an example of what we actually did. Um, the user is jotting down notes um, in their office and experiences a medium cognitive load as indicated by the lower left, this cognitive load indicator. The visibility of the virtual user interface elements that they see, their type of placement, and how much information they show is automatically decided by our system, just by measuring the cognitive load. And I'm going to get to how we kind of estimate that in a second. For the people who, are, who care about how we do that, it's like we want to jointly optimize an interface for users' current context. And this is, in this case, their cognitive load, their task, and their environment. So we take that information, and then an algorithm decides, is an object visible, where is it placed, and how much information does it show, so its level of detail. And the most technical thing I'm going to say is it's a mix of rule-based decision-making and combinatorial optimization that allows us to do that in real time. Um, if you're interested in how the underlying algorithm does that and the objective function, all those things, feel free to come to talk to me. Um, but I'm going to leave it with that and saying what we want to do initially is if the user, if we estimate an increased cognitive load of users, so if you're more stressed, if you're more strained, we want to show less elements based on user's task and their environment. In this example, in this instance of how we solve a computational adaptation problem, we have two types of inputs, and those are very typical for all those systems. So on the left side is the input that is provided by content creators, and that's typically not going to change. So they design applications, like your email applications here, with different levels of detail, whereas on the very left you see just an icon, and on the, on the right side you have the 3D representation with a bit of more information. And we can input additional information, such as how cognitively straining is these, are these things, what is, when do we, how important are they for specific tasks, how useful are they, how often are they used. All of those parameters can be pre-decided, for example. The other part is what is measured by the system. So here, for example, as I said, we measure the cognitive load. What we measure is the number of meaningful pupil dilations as a proxy for cognitive load. So there is some evidence that says if your pupil dilates faster at a meaningful rate, you're experiencing a higher cognitive load, whereas if it's slower. It's a very imperfect measure that I can tell you. Um, it's confounded, kind of, the way it's calculated at least ca compensates for ambient light 
but it doesn't compensate for, ah, you, I'm giving you a difficult task or I'm giving you a very easy task and you're reciting your calendar or your whatever exam, exam you have while I'm giving you the task. So it's really, really hard to measure, but it's a useful proxy information based on the tests we've done. And we need to look more into that, but it seems to work reasonably well in all the evaluations that we did. So that's pretty much the technical part of what, what I want to show you here. I want to show you what we, uh, kind of a couple of implemented scenarios. So one example is here the user is just jotting down notes and experiences a low cognitive load. And what our system and any system could, for example, do is show a bit more information like interesting cat videos or uh, banking information or whatever, um, just because you think that you can actually handle the load and it's useful to have information at hand. Moving to a slightly more challenging task, such as brainstorming, um, with a medium cognitive load as estimated by the system, we show slightly less information that um, is more task relevant, such as inspirational images or um, kind of what your next tasks are. If we then move to a very difficult task, such as reading a difficult scientific paper, we only show minimal information, like what is your next calendar entry, so how much time do you have? So there is, I think, one very prototypical um, instance of a system that adapts based on user's parameter uh, that we measure. Another one, and the lower two are actually, we just finished those projects, like they just got submitted to a conference, so uh, I don't know if they get accepted or rejected, you are definitely the first ones to see them. Um, here's a, an approach where we don't leverage the individual user's perspectives, but, the, but what multiple users are doing. So what the system essentially does is, it senses how many people are there, where they are, and what they are doing. And then, so in this case, it's passed through augmented, uh, augmented reality, so here's what the users are seeing. And if they somewhat stumble into a new position, it's not so easy to navigate, what the system does is automatically changes the position of all the user interface elements to match their new formation and their new spatial position. So they change from a slightly circular position to something where they're more parallel to each other and the system in real time adapts to that. So essentially what this takes into account is, hey, we have people in space and we, it's a good idea to think about where should we place objects. We, we are really concerned here with the type of group formations. Does a new person come into the group? Is someone leaving? What are they talking about? And then we take the virtual user interface elements that we think are useful and the physical objects in the space to avoid occlusion or to also make kind of meaningful connections. And we slap all of them again in, let's call it a black box optimization approach um, that, uh, uh, that takes focus, occlusion, semantic relation, a couple of things into account, and then adapts it the user interface layouts, which are the small blue boxes, or the small boxes in the, in, the, in the right image, to where the physical objects are, where all the users are, and um, does this in real time, any time we sense a meaningful change in group formation and group dynamics. So here's another example. Um, here, uh, uh, blue hair is Katerina and uh, Kyoso. Um, they're chatting about something, and then B is coming in, and. Uh, joins the group for, for, for their communication. Um, and what the system initially looks like is, hey, it's really blocking the view to this third person. And then it, after a time, it detects some change and it automatically reorients everything so that you can actually have a conversation about things. So the notion of where users are in space and how to best adapt to those is really important. Next, uh, then also here are two users that are kind of having a conversation with a third, with a third person um, and the user in this case receives a private message and the private message also has to be taken into account. Is this personal or is this a shared notification? And the system displays this initially where it's very uh, close to the person who receives it and then moves it away while uh, taking all those things into account. So we have to take group formation, shared personal spaces, and a lot of aspects into account if we want the system to actually be useful. So those are two examples of user-centric approaches, individual users or multiple users. The other part that we really care about is to adapt an uh, uh, interface to a specific environment. So here um, I want to show again two approaches 
Um, where the first one, what we are really, really interested in is how to design user interfaces so that they actually match multiple environments. What I mean by that is, I can see, uh, if you imagine you are wearing a virtual reality, uh, an augmented mixed reality headset, and you have adapted your workplace on the left side to perfectly fit kind of the needs of a physical space. So you have kind of, you sit in front of the desk on the left side, you have your windows arranged so they are easy to reach, easy to see, easy to interact with. And then you move into a new space and would like to have the same setup, the same information again. You don't want to have to, every time you move into a space, having to manually rearrange all those aspects. So what, we, what our system does is it takes the layout that the user has created optimally for them and adapts it for a new environment. And the first thing we did when we started this project is actually have, bring people in, have them adapt multiple layouts for multiple different environments. And one thing that somewhat intuitively came up there is what they really care about, or one good anchor, is the semantic connection between virtual and physical objects. And this is one thing we leverage very closely here. So here, on the left side, uh, we have the layout that the user has generated, and they create, for example, the virtual user interface, the PDF document, has been placed very closely to the physical object, the piece of paper. We leverage, we use machine learning to find out these connections where we say, hey, paper and paper, um, brilliant algorithm, paper and PDF and other, and other things are semantically related. Take a couple of other things like, hey, we want this to look nice, we want to have like a nice utility, um, it should not be occlusion, uh, should not be occluded and other things, and then adapt the layout so that objects that are semantically related remain within close, collection, uh, close connection even though the physical objects might have been moved. So here it's paper and paper is not brilliant, but there are other things like the music application, Spotify, virtual Spotify application, it may be a good idea to put close to your physical headphones. Um, so that if you would like to interact with it in augmented reality, you know where to find it easily, even you, if you go across different uh, environments. If the user adjusts those, our system takes those into account and then readjust those for a third layout, for example. So we continuously, we have to continuously update the information we receive from users, from the environment, in order to make a meaningful layout here. Um, I want to show you one or two examples. Um, so here is the user-created layout uh, for the task that's browsing social media. Um, you have a central window with a messenger and then some news applications um, and then a couple of videos. And when they move from one room um, okay, a couple of things at the bottom, to a coffee shop scenario, you still have a central element, but the stuff has moved slightly, has shifted slightly to the left, and the objects are still within some relation so that they make a meaningful layout. The next one I actually like a bit better, where you have a travel planning scenario, um, where the user has been planning some travel um, with, a, with a computer, and this was... Um, sent obviously to a, to a different conference, some food items. And when they move to the kitchen, items that get rearranged, so for example here the information on the, um, with, the, with the cookies gets placed next to the, uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the jar of physical nuts, and then the information about the botanical garden got placed next to the plants, and all those things are decided automatically by the system on the fly, so that it's easier for users to move to transition between environments. The last example I want to show you for these adaptive systems is where we try to as tightly as possible integrate virtual objects into the physical world so that they no longer stand out that much. All the examples I've shown you so far are flat 2D windows that are slapped somewhere in, sla in space so that they're, that they're reasonably meaningful. With this last project that we created, um, which was led by, by uh, my student Violet, um, what we did is we tried to very tightly integrate the virtual objects into the physical ones. So if you look at this image, the virtual objects in this image are on the very right, the temperature, then the two icons, Gmail and Google Chrome, and the text that is on the, the other two icons. I think you should see it that they're slightly, kind of they're slightly floating and wiggling, but only, and all the rest is are actual physical objects. So I'll show you a couple of more examples. So essentially this starts with the observation that, hey, it's kind of cool to have your virtual elements like on your phone or your desktop um, around all the time. But if it's 2D, 
especially if this becomes more objects, it's very distracting. If you imagine like here sitting in the living room and there's like floating objects everywhere, it's kind of annoying. Again, remember premise, make less annoying interfaces. Yes, the head scratching is very natural. <laughs> we are researchers, not actors. Um, if we now move to the, our integrated environment, you see that the uh, virtual interface elements, like the stuff that's placed on the head, on the kind of the, the, um, the plush toy on the back, is much more integrated, and it's still very accessible here. So essentially what we do is we take the physical objects that are in a space, and their geometry, which we retrieve through scanning, and then take 2D mobile phone applications like you use on your phone, and we extract which ones are actually meaningful, do a bunch of geometry processing uh, in the back to say, okay, where are good objects to place it, um, are they visible, are they not occluded, and whatever. And then we optimize algorithmically where to best, which parts of a mobile phone application to place, and where to put them. So, and on the right side, you see the, uh, the air purifier, air refresher, or whatever the thing is, um, as viewed through a mixed reality headset and, um, and tightly integrated. All of that is automatically generated. So here are two, example of, uh, two examples of, of how this looks, two or three examples. On the left side, um, you have two people in a conversation. One is wearing this very bulky mixed reality headset, um, but we hope in the future that both would be wearing that um, in a nicer way. And the objects are nicely integrated so that the user has constant information. So on the right, bottom right, you have like the air purifier with the Domino's interface so they can quickly order pizza. Um, and on the top, you have like the weather application that's projected on the head. For the personal uh, application here, that's the one you've seen before. You see the objects that are non-augmented. And then if you take the view from the headset, you see that the applications have quick access icons, so that if, the, if you were to press those, the actual thing uh, could uh, very easily come up, so it has a tighter integration. And in this last example here, um, they, use a kind of, they have kind of a conversation about whatever mathematical thing they're doing, <laughs> and you see that on the, on the left side, on the left side of the right user, the applications are um, are tightly integrated into the objects, again, all automatically um, to say, hey, I would like those applications to be accessible for me, that I can, in theory, access them when I wanted to, but I don't want them to be overpowering. So those are typical approaches where I think if we want the future where mixed reality interfaces can complement some of the devices that we use, here are some of the main parameters that I think are going to be important. So, these type of adaptive mixed reality really need to, can leverage the rich contextual information that all of us live on, which is kind of our internal state, what tasks we're doing, all the environments. And then they can define when, where, and how to display virtual interfaces. Mostly also because manually designing for all these scenarios, if you're a programmer, a designer, is just not feasible. It's still hard problems, right? otherwise it wouldn't be researched. User modeling and environmental detection, as I said earlier, are really hard. Cognitive uh, load estimation is challenging. Semantic connections are challenging. And all of these while keeping kind of the use, a user-first approach. So the user needs to be able to predict what the user interface is doing. When you open your phone and you click on your email app, you know what's going to happen. If you click an icon and you open email, but it's actually a messenger or your maps, this part would be incredibly annoying. Um, so we need to be able to have all these algorithms, but they still need to be able uh, to, you still need to be able to very tightly predict what, what's actually happening. For the last part, I very briefly want to talk about this third part that I mentioned, where we talk about enhancing users' capabilities of something that they typically can't do before, in one example um, that my student Hyunsung uh, um, has created. So here, um, is Hyunsung trying to kind of convince me or uh, show I'm wearing the headset in this case, and she's sorting some stuff and I get distracted. So I'm actually not, pay I'm not paying attention to what she's doing. What I'm wearing is a virtual, this augmented reality headset with a 360 camera. What I can do is, in situ, you see the small shadow, see what she has done while I was not, uh, while I was not looking, and can retrace all her steps. 
It's a system that we somewhat cheesily call missed reality. So it visualizes all the things that you might have missed. Um, and we use this here for collaborative item sorting uh, and other things. So what we do is, as you've seen, we have a 360 degree camera integrated or semi-integrated in the headset. And then we extract on the left side this uh, multiple primary regions and the user selects which one they care about. Then we kind of we take this region, remember the saliency prediction, gas prediction that I talked earlier. Um, we predict what objects would you care about. We run machine learning to detect which objects they are and where are they. And then we combine all those things into a set of visualizations with different levels of abstraction that allow you to see ah, how, where did things move. So on the top left, you have the actual, um, the actual the thing that has happened, and then different types of visualizations from with varying level of abstraction, just motion lines, then the shadow, and then the actual object that is moving. And users can choose which of those they like. So this is really a capability enabling you to see something that you have missed that is not possible with smartphone and other devices. So here is a couple of examples of what we did. Is here is a progress check, uh, check of personal trainer that doesn't pay attention. Uh, Hyunsung tries to cheat. Um, trainer kind of can actually go back and see what is going on uh, and essentially visualize how many repetitions she did uh, and then kind of correct for that. Um, we think there is actually kind of, these are somewhat fun examples, but um, if you think about an um, educational scenario, maintenance, where you say, hey, let me show you how to fix this engine, but you also have to take notes at the same time. Um, this can be very valuable. Or if you go to a sports game, there's kind of some interesting stuff happening while you are distracted with, someone, with something else. Um, you can go back and, at your own pace, see what has actually happened. So here is kind of the canonical cooking example, which is a complex task. So those are, I think, the main three components when it comes to really designing a future of mixed reality where it, become the it can become the next paradigm in computing, when we move from mainframe computing, desktop computing, smartphone computing, to potentially something that's going to replace and really change how we interact with digital information. There is a lot of stuff to do, and all of the things that I think are key components are still open challenges. None of these things is somewhat solved. As a bonus, there are like a thousand different things that also don't work. I'm here at Kermit, right? Mixed reality currently, a lot of the research is predominantly in the visual domain. Uh, how the headsets work, how um, really a lot of the interaction works. But we are more than just visuals. There is a lot of very interesting works, work on uh, auditory augmented reality, but really multimodal and trying to find out under which context which information is the best to display is going to be key for any kind of useful type of um, mixed reality. We don't have a lot of experience with large context changes for these systems, so what happens if you really were to move from the living room to the office to outside? How should those systems behave? One of the things that I find super exciting is that actually none of this works. So we can actually build the technology with things like accessibility and user models in mind there. We say, hey, this is not a technology that is developed. Um, and then kind of as an afterthought, we make it work for, uh, for users with visual disability. No, we can actually include those in the ground up in terms of accessibility. So Yu Heng Zhao is doing fantastic work and use, leveraging the technology. But also in terms of privacy. The missed reality project that I've just shown you should, I hope, give you, gave you goosebumps in terms of privacy, right? There's someone with a 360-degree de camera continuously monitoring me. So a lot of these things have to be negotiated on a societal level. What are we comfortable with and in what context? Plus, on a system engineering context, imagine you're wearing your AR headset and someone decides, as I said, to block your view just at the right time that you get hit by a bus. Suboptimal and annoying. So you really don't want it. So we can actually have these things uh, built in. And lastly, we also, I mean, I'm kind of enthusiastic about some of the technology, but also we ne always need to be careful, right? If you think about, I'm not sure when was the last time you were at New York Times Square, it's busy. It's visually busy, it's auditorily busy, it's a lot of people, there's a lot of stuff going on. And now imagine that 
at every single instance of your life that it's filled with stuff. Uh, here's Kei Chimatsura's Hyperreality, and it's a, I've said that in the workshop, but I highly recommend watching some of his movies on, it's a seven minute movie on YouTube, about what could actually happen if we had a technology that can display anything anytime, uh, anywhere and looks like that. I would throw it out and you should write fully so too. Nevertheless, I'm still excited um, that what we have achieved so far and what is going to come. If you think about 50, 60 years back, um, I don't think that any of that is going to happen within the next six months. There, there are continuously significant developments that make me hopeful that we actually can get some of the stuff right. But I'm excited to actually maybe at some point even get rid of our phones that we only have for 15 years, so it feels longer. But I think there's an exciting future ahead, especially when we take all the multimodality into account and have systems that actually are beneficial and less distracting. That's it from my side. Thank you so much for coming out to, uh, this evening. I think we have a couple of minutes for, for, for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.